For the first time at a Bay Brazil conference, I have the pleasure and honor to uh, introduce you and invite you to join me here, Mike Krieger. Oh, you are here. Oh my gosh, what happened? Hi, <laughs> First of all, it's great to be here. Hello, everybody. Um, sorry, I'm broken wing here, but recovering. Um, I was not sure if it was going to be in Portuguese or in English, but we'll do English. You can ask questions in Portuguese, too. You can do whatever. Um, so yeah, I was born in, born in Sao Paulo, uh, but I moved around a bit as a kid. So my dad worked at a company called Seagram's. They make a bunch of uh, distilled drinks. And uh, for a while, we lived in, in Portugal and Lisbon. Uh, we lived in Buenos Aires, um, and we lived in Miami for a little bit. And what was really cool about that was um, it gave me the perspective, obviously, of different countries, but it also gave me the experience of trying to stay in touch with people that were in different countries. Like It, also, it was cool to meet new people, but also kind of lonely, right? Um, I noticed this because I think moving around a, a, that much is fairly uncommon. I've been to weddings you know, since then, and I always have the, per the person's like best man or, or um, I was going to say first lady. They're not called first ladies. What are they called? The maid of honor. Um, and the maid of honor will be like, and I've known this person since I was two. And I didn't really have that experience. That was like something that was different growing up is I basically had a new set of friends every four years. But it actually ended up influencing, I think, some of Instagram later, which is the idea of being able to stay in touch and stay connected to people, even if you're in a different country, even if you've moved away. Um, but yeah, my mom was uh, in advertising. And then later, it was a, a designer. Uh, so I kind of had that artistic side growing up as well. Um, and then my dad, I think knew a lot about, um, knows a lot about um, marketing, about business, about companies, um, but also was really interested in technology. So when I was, gosh, six years old, uh, he brought the first computer into our house, and it was like an IBM 386, like very basic MS DOS, and I loved it. I would like spend, uh, you know, afternoons like messing around and more breaking it than doing anything interesting with it. Um, but I think in the way that other kids got Legos and were really interested in Legos, and I actually have never, I'm gonna go back and ask him now soon, like why, what inspired him to get something, a computer that early? But it was really, I think, pivotal for me to start um, playing around with it since then. And, and ever since, he's been very interested in, in technology. And I, you know, I kind of got that from him as well. Um, and yeah, I went to an American school. I went to a graded. Did anybody go to graded? There's always like one or two. Yeah, there we go, at least one. Uh, so it's called Graduada. That's the American school in Sao Paulo. It's really a strong school. And that, that's where it continued um, my interest in technology, but also my interest in, in, in interaction design. So um, there was a program at school where you could do community service and, and kind of work with the local communities. And if you've ever been to Sao Paulo, and especially if you've seen Graded, it's in a really interesting place. It's in Morumbi, and it's on a hill. And there's a favela, literally, that comes up against the the, top, the bottom of the hill. And um, the cool thing about that, I mean, it, the sad thing is it shows the disparity that's so clear in Sao Paulo. But the interesting thing is that it actually offered a lot of opportunities for uh, programs that the school had put together. So one of them was um, you could go into um, uh, the, the favela and like meet people and also like teach them basic literacy or teach them technology. And in doing that, I started realizing that all the things I took for granted, because I've been a nerdy kid since I was you know four or five years old playing with the computer, like how to use a mouse, how to type, what's email, how do you tell if the browser is working or it, it was an error, all these things, I, I, they're easy because I got used to them. If you're coming to computers for the first time are actually very difficult and th the barrier to entry isn't just get them a computer, it's like how do you use this and, and um, that's what really got me excited and not just working on technology but working on making technology easier for people to use and that's what I saw as my main thing I wanted to do uh, you know, after I graduated and growing up. So that was really formative. So I think so much of Instagram came from the kind of Brazilian upbringing I had. And I think that was one piece which was really it chose my career. I didn't want to just code. I wanted to build useful software. And at that time, you knew you wanted to be an entrepreneur? I didn't. And I think about this often because I go back to Brazil and I meet entrepreneurs and, and think about what it was like. You know, I left in 2004. And there were obviously examples of very strong Brazilian entrepreneurs in non-technical fields, but less in technology. I think the most famous one was like Facebook's Eduardo, and that was like a complicated one. So it wasn't like, and even him, actually, Facebook started in 2004, so it wasn't even that then. So I 
never really thought I wanted to do a startup because it wasn't, uh, I didn't have a bunch of examples of people who had done that. And even at, you know, I remember I was applying for a, a scholarship before leaving Brazil and it, the people I was surrounding with were all business folks and not, technology was not seen as, you know, a viable thing that you could be an entrepreneur for in Brazil. So it was only in coming to the United States and then starting to meet uh, entrepreneurs who are, you know, some Brazilian, but mostly um, folks who'd either grown up here or moved here. And seeing that as a career path is what opened my eyes. And that's what I try to do now. Um, and I hope, I think it's, it's, there's far more examples of it happening now in Brazil, which is really exciting, where you see, I think it takes a few people to both, you know, do it and hopefully succeed and then talk about it and provide that kind of inspiration uh, to start that cycle. And how did you meet Kevin Sistrom? Yeah, so my co-founder and I met, um, we met in college originally. So I was studying this degree that, it was funny because the only reason I discovered this degree was because of Brazil and I'll tell you why. So the degree is called Symbolic Systems and only Stanford has it. And it's a mix of computer science, design, psychology. It's basically exactly what I was interested in in terms of making software useful, but as a whole kind of degree program. And the reason I discovered it was, uh, Orkuchi was really big in Brazil in 2004. <laughs> Facebook didn't exist. And uh, if you heard of Orkuchi, who was on Orkuchi at the time? So Orkuchi's best and worst feature, this is a total tangent, sorry, but it's the, at the top of your profile, you would say, it would say like, how, what percent of your friends thought you were cool, hot, or like, or trustworthy, which was a really interesting measure. Um, and it was hard for a teenager to, to grapple with those numbers. But anyway, so I went on Orkuchi and I was like, all right, what are the Stanford groups on Orkut? Like, there must be some. And there was only one, and it was the Symbolic Systems program, which like, I, I guess somebody from the program made a, an Orkut page for that um, degree. And I was like, I haven't heard of this before, but it sounds interesting. So actually, that's how I discovered that it existed. And I, I don't know if I actually would have found it and decided to do it. Maybe I would have studied computer science. It really changed my life in that, that moment. So. I did that program, um, and as part of it, I also studied entrepreneurship because, it, you know, a couple of years into Stanford, I started getting very interested uh, in entrepreneurship. And I did a program called the Mayfield Fellows Program, where you spend three months studying entrepreneurship, three months working at a startup, but you have to find the job yourself. So they just they don't provide a lot of support, and then three months basically making case studies out of the uh, experience that you had uh, at the startup. And Kevin, my co-founder, had done the same program. Uh, a year before me, and he had actually worked at Odeo, which is the company that became Twitter. So he had that experience of seeing a company in that pivot moment. Uh, and I worked at a company called Fox Marks, which doesn't exist anymore. It was kind of sold later for not very much. But the cool thing about Fox Marks is the CEO was Mitch Kapor, who founded Lotus123, which I remember using Lotus on my MS-DAWs you know, PC back in the day. So it was very cool to hear his stories about um, you know, technology and entrepreneurship from the 80s to today. But yeah, I met him through that program and then we stayed in touch afterwards. Uh, fast forward to 2010. You create your photo sh sharing app is downloaded by thousands in a matter of hours. How did it happen? Tell us about that moment. Um, I think a couple of things went into making the launch successful. One was, um, it was just a different age. It's, People are launching into a much more crowded market these days where it's, it, it, I, we talk and hear about app fatigue. So people are just like, they don't need another app on their phones. Even actually, it's interesting. I compared, I did this experiment. I found a screenshot I had taken of my home screen in 2011. And of, from then to like 2015, almost all the apps changed. Obviously, Instagram was on both. But, you know, I use a different app for my Twitter app. I use a different app for reading the news. I use a different app for like ways and, and, didn't really exist, and Lyft, and Uber. Um, but then I compare like 2015 to 2017, and it's almost identical. So we seem to have hit a moment of maybe some consolidation, um, and it's just a, a different moment. But in 2010, there was a lot of energy, and I felt like every week everybody was downloading an app and signing up for something. So I think there was real desire and interest to try something new. And two was, there was really nothing else that was that easy to use and free, which was important, that would make your um, the things that you were, could do with the iPhone camera at the time look good and be shareable. So iPhone comes out in 2007. The first one, I mean, if you remember, the camera was pretty bad. It was the best they could you know, include at the time, but it was fairly limited. It got better and better. And actually, 2010 was this interesting moment where the launch that they did for the iPhone, I guess it was the 4, which was that the first one that was in that like nicer, you know, rounded, thin format. And they spent a lot of time on the keynote that year about the camera. But the thing was, you would take photos on it and you would be like, wow, I can't believe my phone can do this. But then you, they were stuck. You could, 
upload them to Facebook, to upload them to Facebook, it was like this very long, very complicated path. Twitter didn't allow photos at the time, believe it or not. You remember 2010, it's not that long ago, but things have changed. Flickr existed, but it was more like, these are my professional photos, almost more like a portfolio. So there was a real gap in the market, and that's one thing I identified. We wanted to take the photos that were increasingly being taken on the phone. So by the way, that was the first year on Flickr, 2010, where the most popular camera wasn't the Canon XTI or a Nikon D series, it was the iPhone. So that was kind of an interesting moment, and we timed it really, I mean, I can't say we were super strategic about it, we just happened to be building it right then, and we were interested in, in helping people share visuals. Um, and then the last one was our marketing strategy to launch. So I think we did two things right. One is we built some buzz up by um, not going to photographers, which is where you maybe would expect us to go, we realized really quickly photographers were threatened by Instagram in the first version because they're like, oh, everybody's going to think they're a photographer. I'm a photographer. Like, get this thing away from me. Like, I don't want it. It's low resolution. Filters are tacky. Like, they just didn't like it, which is fine. You know, it's not for everybody that when you launch. Uh, but designers actually were the perfect initial kind of beta testing and initial marketing group because they're visually oriented. They often, if you if you know a designer in your life, they probably have like three or four different cameras. Like I find the correlation between like amateur or prosumer photographers and designers is very high because they're interested in visual and they're interested in craft. So we went after them. There's a site called dribble.com, which was kind of like, I was gonna say it's like Instagram for design, but it came before us. So maybe we're like dribble for, for photos. But anyway, they were around for a while. And we went to their top ranking and we just wrote emails to every one of their top designers and said, hey, we have a new app. Do you want to try it out? And what that led to was a, a small but growing community of people that were sharing really good content. And I remember the reaction everybody had when they saw Instagram on the day we launched was, wow, how did you take that on a phone? That's amazing. I didn't know that was possible. And it was because, I think, partially because of this group um, that we went after. And then the last one was doing the PR ourselves. And I, this is something I still advise companies that I advise. Like, it was something very authentic about me and Kevin. And we didn't really know what we were doing. But we just wrote to all the tech publications we could. We tried to get in front of them. We talked to them. And the fact that it was coming from us, and it was our story, and it was our kind of passion that we had built over the last year or so really translated well and, and got people interested in talking to us. And I think that led to a good wave. We actually didn't have our own PR until we got to Facebook two and a half years later. So we did a lot of that ourselves and it, and it worked well. And then 18 months later, after launching, it gets acquired by Facebook. Tell us about that process. It's 18 months, but it was also kind of 18 months in the making. So a thing that happens when you launch a company, especially one that like gets initial traction, is you get a phone call, or and actually nobody uses the phone anymore. You get an email from all the uh, corporate development departments at all the all the different companies, and they're very friendly. They're like, "Hey, we just want to know if we can be helpful and like let you get to know you guys, host you for lunch," and like the subtext is like. We want to see if we should buy you now or like wait to see where he goes. And so we did the rounds. And I remember talking to the Facebook team. And they were really excited about what we were doing and a couple of the other companies. But we had just launched. And we, you know, we actually, the only money that we had spent up to that point was paying my salary, which we found the minimum salary we could pay with the H-1B. And we like paid me that and like, paid Kevin like a dollar. And like we were very lean. Where uh, were you guys living at that time? Uh, I was living, um, it's funny actually, I was living in Petrero Hill. And th I, the day we launched was the day I moved in with my girlfriend then wife. So I tried, I don't know, the dumbest idea I've ever had is launch a product and also try to move in with somebody at the same week. It was really <laughs> a bad idea. So we're still together. And I don't know how, but that was a that was, that's where you were. So I, we, I was living in, in in the lower Haight in San Francisco. But you know, small apartment, like so just trying to get things off the ground. Like our daily meal was like a they had a sandwich deal across the street from our startup incubator. Just like trying to get things going. Um, but beginning of we just launched, we weren't ready to to go off and and get sold or anything. And actually, that was the plan even 18 months later. So we'd raise one more round in between there, about three or four months in, because we initially had a small amount, so we wanted to raise enough to go hire people. We wanted to raise enough to buy Instagram.com, because at the beginning, we only had Instagram gram with a dot between the GR and the AM. And AM is Armenia. And like, who knows, like one day Armenia wakes up and is like, ah, we don't want your site to exist anymore. Because, you know, it's actually, this is a real risk that nobody talks about. Like so many like hot startups are like, you know, expensely or whatever, dot L-O-I, that's in Libya. And like, 
good luck. Like, you know, the TL, the domain registrar could change their mind at any time. But And actually, .io went down for like most of yesterday. Anyway, side topic. But uh, so we bought Instagram.com, hired our first employees. And then in March of 2012, we actually sort of got it ready to raise another round because we were looking at two major things. One, we were, starting, we were spending, spending a lot of money on Amazon. So we were, you know, in the million plus dollar a month range in terms of how much we were spending uh, on Amazon Web Services. and. That made sense because our team was six engineers. Like we had no time or energy to go and hire a you know a infrastructure team to go build a data center. Like that would be crazy. So it was the right choice, but it also was a cost that was creeping up. So we were starting to explore: is it time to build our own, or is it time to do some kind of hybrid? Um, and then just be able to expand our team because again, we were six engineers and very small. So we. Did all the fundraising, all that fun stuff that many of you have gone through. Um, you know, talked to a bunch of different groups, settled on Sequoia because we were really excited to work with Roloff. And then, basically, the week that the that was all signed and sealed, um, is I think Zuck got wind of it and was like, "All right, I'm going to make these guys like one more offer, like make, see if they see if they'll take it and like see if they'd be ready to join." How many he had done before? Nothing formal, so it would be more like conversational before, but we'd always been like, yeah, like no matter what the number, we're like not really interested in it. Um, and it was really funny, like I don't rec like no strategic person would raise around and then sell. Like it doesn't make sense. Like you've you've just diluted yourself. And we could have done some like, you know, shenanigans to like go back on it, but we wanted to like have integrity. So we closed the round and then and then did the deal. Um, but mostly because we felt we'd be able to continue building the product and company we wanted to build just within this larger umbrella. And Facebook was at this really important inflection moment when they were about to go public, this is 2012, um, and also ready to think about themselves not as just Facebook the product that everybody was using at that point more and more on their phones, but as more of Facebook Inc, where there are multiple properties and multiple brands. and we were excited to hear that vision, and we thought, all right, we get to do all the fun parts of doing Instagram, um, but then we get to skip a lot of the building up of like an international legal team that has relationships with all governments around the world, and an HR department, and sales, and um, it gives us more cover as we build out a monetization strategy. So, I mean, I can't say it was an easy decision because, again, we were excited to do it independently, and there was a world also where we did the deal, and then we arrived at Facebook, and the next week they were like, great, like, let's go, you guys are going to work on the Photos app team, and we're shutting down Instagram. It was a risk, or, you know, you can't put in the contract, like, you will keep Instagram around, that doesn't exist. So, um, it was a bit of a gamble, but we, we had trust in the process. Uh, tell us about how it was to work with Mark, or how it is actually to work with Mark Zuckerberg, and what are the main lessons that you learned, and how much in influence or, or, or how much he uh, wanted to influence Instagram from the point where uh, he, he was acquired. It's funny. So there's a thing at Facebook called a Zuck review, which is exactly what it sounds like. If you're working on a product and you're going to launch it or it's under review or it's under development, you schedule a Zuck review, which is you go to uh, his office and your team is there and you present what you're building and he gives you feedback. And, you know, when it's a Facebook team, like you're working on groups or, you know, Messenger, he'll be like, yeah, like you have to change this. I, you know, I don't like this rethink this, this looks great. You know, he's very opinionated. And we went in for our first and only Zuck review. We were launching something. He's like, this is good. I mean, if it were my product, I might do this differently, but I told you guys I'd leave you guys alone. So, and then we we're like, why are we doing this? And it was like, very, and it was like kind of awkward for everybody. And it was once was enough. And we're like, okay, so let's, let's figure out an operating model that makes, that matches the actual setup. So now we do every six months, we sit down with him, with Cheryl, with all the other Facebook leadership, almost more like a board meeting, walk through what our roadmap is for the following six months, and then we get to do it. So it works really nicely. We kind of set what that cadence looks like. Um, but that was a kind of initial thing. But one thing I've learned to really, really appreciate about Zuck is he's able to think about things far beyond, like on a time horizon that is beyond what we were even, you know, considering. So I remember talking to him about video even in 2012, and he had seen like the building blocks that you need for video to be an important part. We actually didn't have Instagram video in 2012, so he was really thinking ahead. Um, different things around international expansion, different things around monetization. So. I've, Never met somebody who has like that kind of ability to like you know play chess two or three levels ahead, and it's something that we've we've learned from a lot. He's like a deeply strategic thinker, and it's been fun to to learn from that. And I think the other part that I'll give him a ton of credit for is the vision to build that FB to FB Inc strategy. So to now have you know pillars like Instagram and Oculus and WhatsApp to be able to operate in a way that 
people are excited about, like get to build internally. Um, I think it takes a certain, I, I imagine myself acquiring a company, like I would want to go in there and change all the stuff that didn't exactly match. So it takes a certain amount of, uh, I think, discipline to say, all right, like here's the things that really matter that I want to talk to them about, and here's the things that I want to let them remain independent on. Great. Well, Mike, I have, uh, I think, other 37 the questions or so. <laughs> How many hours do you have? <laughs> uh, but I want for this to be very interactive. Uh, we have Thais here with a mic, and we have uh, um, Evelyn uh, this side with another mic. Uh, questions? Thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. I appreciate it. I'll start with the easier one. Uh, how relevant is Instagram for Brazil, or Brazil for Instagram? So good question. So I will take zero credit for Brazil being one of our biggest countries, meaning like I don't think it's because I'm a co-founder, maybe a little bit, but maybe to tell that story initially, but it's huge. So Brazil is one of our three or four biggest countries. And what really excites me about Brazil is um, we're seeing people use our, they love adopting our new products. So when we launch Story is one of the first countries that started really picking it up and making it part of you know their main Instagram experience for them was stories and same for live and which is impressive because you know I, I go home at least once a year and things improve year on year but especially like when I was there two years ago even it was like even using Instagram video products especially was very slow unless you were on a good Wi-Fi connection so despite I think some of the challenges around network bandwidth and it's you know, 4G is available, but it doesn't really feel like 4G in a lot of places in Brazil. That's in Sao Paulo, especially. Um, and people are still adopting and using Instagram. So that's really, really cool to see. And then the other side, and this is, um, so my side is obviously the product and technology and the business is something I've learned about in the last few years. And the most recent time, I actually got to spend time with people in marketing. And obviously, Brazil has like a very rich, long tradition of great people who have worked in advertising and marketing and communications. I think that's like a real thing to be proud of, and uh, I got to meet some of them, and it was really cool to hear about how they were thinking about this shift to digital, because you know, Brazil is still like having things nominated at the, the con, like advertising awards, but more like traditional media, and to hear the ideas that they've started to come up with on Instagram in terms of taking that new platform was really exciting. So that's another big interesting piece for us for Brazil, which is how, as Brazil's spend on advertising shifts to digital, how can we be an important part of that, given how big we are there? Let me, let me ask you one more question, a little more difficult, I think. Bay Brazil is all about connecting, right? People in, from Brazil, Silicon Valley, successful entrepreneurs like yourself. Now that you are a successful story, do you plan to give back? Do you plan to invest in startups or entrepreneurs or companies in, in Brazil? Yeah, that's a good question, too. So I, um, I've thought about a couple of different things. And I think the biggest constraint so far has honestly just been time. Um, one is getting involved through investing. So uh, Julio Vasconcelos, who probably a lot of you know, like actually my I had a fork in the road where Julio was like, come to Brazil and like found Patient Bono with me. And I was like, I like just got this Instagram thing started. I think I'm going to stay around. And then I got to see him and his kind of story from afar. Um, he and a couple others set up Canary, which probably many of you are familiar with, too, which is investing in kind of early stage Brazilian startups. So being involved through that is something I'm excited about. And you know, doing things like podcasts, I just recorded one about entrepreneurship for the Brazil, like in Portuguese for that audience. So both investing and right now probably investing via those kinds of funds where you know it's more scalable than me trying to find what the interesting startups are there. And there's great people on the ground doing that work. Um, and then also trying to contribute back through talks, through podcasts, through articles, through things like this, um, which are, you know, I think, high leverage and can reach a good audience. But I'm also super open to ideas about how to contribute back, so I'm all ears. Great, we have some for you, Mike. <laughs> Careful what I ask, what I wish for, yeah. Uh, this side, do we have a question right there? And then we'll go back that way. I know we have another one right there. Hey, Mike, Ricardo, Ricardo Geromel, good friend of Margaret's. I used to be a reporter for Forbes. Oh, nice. So you're welcome to write an article, and I'll make sure it gets published at Forbes.com, <laughs> if that interests you. It's funny to hear you call Brazil home. Mm -hmm. um, you do not have an accent. Great work, great. <laughs> um, tell us about your vision of the future. You mentioned Zuck, if you allow me, talking about video in 2012. You're in 2017. What are you? What is the world going to be like in 2027? The same way that we cannot imagine our lives without the, our iPhones and smartphones today. Ten years ago. We were not, it was not part of our day to day. So if you can tell us about that. And 
if you can make us a favor and tell us about some failures of yours, that would be great too. Yeah. What of so, uh, failures, fracas? Oh, failures, yeah, right. failures. Yeah. Uh, cool. It's a two, two part question. Uh, on the future, I always like to ground it in um, the role that Instagram can play rather than the technology. Because there's always going to be technology that rolls around. So, you know, it's 2017. In 2010, when we started, people were talking about augmented reality and virtual reality as like a sci fi dream rather than something that was incorporated, you know, in real products today. Even video was like, as I mentioned, kind of ahead of the curve. Even the idea of like very fast connectivity, you want to live stream from a phone anywhere that you are, basically, as long as you have connectivity. Like these were things that were. In like very, it felt like very far. But the thing that hasn't changed is the goal, which for Instagram it is to bring you closer to the people and interests that you care about. So the way I see it is, let's imagine what could serve that goal really well three years, five years, ten years from now. You know, will it be ubiquitous capture where you're not just capturing a photo or a video, but you're capturing in 360 degrees? So if you're back in Brazil and I'm your friend and I want to see what you're up to right now, like. That's the kind of experience that I can have is totally immersive, both on the consumer side, but also when you're producing, be able to capture things in a really rich way. And you're starting, again, it's like Instagram, we, we like to play in the point where technology is available and globally available, but not quite used in the right way. And I, feel, I felt that way about photos. I felt that way about videos. I felt that way about live streaming, where we've been able to be one of the largest live platforms in the world, because we took it something that people had been talking about for a couple of years, but made it really useful and combined it with the power of our existing network. Um, so I think like, more rich capture, I think, is absolutely something in there. I remain really convinced that the phone is still the best, or something portable that doesn't involve like putting a headset on, is like going to be the dominant way in which we we consume and produce. So I think it'll look similar to that. Um, the whole live streaming experience right now on Instagram, it's both promising but also very limited. You, I don't know if you've ever watched the live stream and just felt like you wanted to talk back to the person because it felt like they were there. I want you to feel even more that way. And in fact, I want you to be able to have that conversation and like replicate that experience of being in the room with somebody. Um, as you go somewhere, I think that's that's very very exciting. Um, there's a less kind of you know uh, what do you say like polished not polished. There's a less like shiny area, but I think it's really important. Is also making Instagram usable for the next you know hundreds of millions of people around the world. So a lot of the things I spend my time on are. How do we make in Instagram work really well in emerging markets where they don't have great connectivity yet or their phones have limited storage space? Like we didn't have a website until like two years ago. So we're like building and catching up in some of those things and building out a mobile experience. So I think there's this bifurcation where at the top end, like deeper and richer capture, making you feel closer and closer to the person and how they're experiencing it. And then on the um, emerging side, Again, solving the same problem around making you feel closer to your friends and interests, but that's more of an accessibility question than like a future dreaming question. But I think it's always important, again, to ground it in that, like, what problem are you solving? I've seen companies get caught up in the, what technology do we have available? And it's like, you've inverted the problem. And then like, falhas, fracassos. Um, I mean, the story of Instagram is, is a series of these, right? We were working on the wrong product for about nine months that wasn't succeeding. It had like a thousand users at peak. Um, and instead of, you know, one of the failures, and people talk about the Instagram pivot as a success, which it ultimately was, but we also could have done it six months earlier. Like we had the data, and it's very, very easy. And I have to spend a lot of time with entrepreneurs that I, I um, advise trying to get them out of this rut that they get stuck in to believe that you're just one feature revision away from like totally turning your company around. And it's rarely the case that like, n plus one is the answer. It's probably like n minus 10. And like something was probably right early on and you'd have to shift something there rather than great. Like now we have this thing that's going to totally change the trajectory of the company. I've, I don't think I've ever actually seen that work. So I think, believe pretty strongly that it's if things are not working well, it's not like more and more that's going to get you there. And we fell into that trap for a long time. And again, we could have done this six months earlier, but then who knows, maybe that would have been too early and the iPhone 4 wouldn't have come out. So yeah, you know, these things are, are easy to judge in, in hindsight. Uh, hey, hey, Mike. This is Paulo from Arena. Uh, my question is about scalability. Um, the early stages, I noticed that you guys took a while to launch the Android app. So why was the reason, if you guys had the resources, why did you guys build both apps? And uh, since you guys are mobile first and decided to go with iOS until late stages, I think when you guys had like 15 million users and then you guys decided to launch the Android app. Uh, and what do you recommend for other startups doing the, in the same process, scaling? And uh, you know, going international because probably Android is the best answer for international. Yeah, I think the answer is more complicated today than it was in 2010 when we launched. So in 2010, Android was I actually had one of the 
first generations of Android phone. I thought it was really good. I forgot the model name, but it was one of the first ones that Google partnered with somebody on. It was like a beautiful phone, actually. Um, but they, you know, it was not quite huge yet. It was growing, but the iPhone had taken a, a you know initial lead, and Android was starting to to pick up. The way I think about this is every piece of complexity you add to your company early on slows down your ability to be very nimble. So even like adding a first or second or third engineer after your co-founding pair means that that's like one more person to like get aligned with, right? Like I feel like I spend my job these days is like getting alignment or like, oh, we have 300 engineers now. Like let's make sure they're all aligned. And it's much easier when it's you and your co-founder and you can like totally change the direction of the company in, mo in a morning. Um, and so we were slow to hire for a couple of reasons. One was we were just not very good at it and we didn't invest the amount of time we needed to. And so we fell into the trap of now we're really busy and we don't have time to hire and now we're busier and we don't have time. It was like a, a little bit of a downward spiral. And that was one of the problems that actually coming to Facebook fixed, which was they have a really rich hiring pipeline, so that was great. Um, but the advantage was that we could make very quick decisions and change because of our size. And I think the same thing was true about platforms. We first tried to get product market fit with a product on one platform, which was iOS. It's possible today I'd actually choose to start on Android. It's hard to say, but I think it would depend on the product. Um, but the key was really like, we were iterating so quickly in the first year and a half. And it was cool, by the time we built our Android app, we basically were able to give the one Android engineer we had like a spec, which was the iPhone app, and we're like, just build this. And you know that had taken us a year and a half up to that point in terms of building the iOS app, and we did Android in three months. So you were able to do it fairly quickly once it was clear that the iPhone app had real clear um, product market fit. But yeah, we've always, the one of our company philosophies is do fewer things better, and I think that was the idea. It's like, we can't really do two platforms well from the beginning, so let's pick one and make that work. And if that doesn't work, then it's, again, it, adding two is not going to make it work. I've also seen that too, like this company that like launches and like gets through that, you know, initial launch and then goes through and doesn't show very good retention. So it's kind of shedding users over time. They're like, we launched the Android app, then it's going to work. It's like, no, the Android app will probably demonstrate the same curve, maybe to a slightly larger audience. Um, um, I want to ask about infrastructure. So in the beginning, how many users did the site held? And did you ever crash? And <laughs> And um, um, did you ever rebuild the site? And what would you recommend for founders um, if you would have, you know, w with your experience now? I think what we didn't know was really important. So we didn't have a lot of infrastructure experience, which meant that we built a pretty, I'm going to say like flimsy infrastructure, but it meant we launched really quickly. So the, the opposite trap that I've seen um, companies fall into is like, well, if we get 10 million users, like, is our infrastructure going to hold up to that? It's like, you're lucky if you get 10, right? So like, let's get that going and then prove it. And, and we, we didn't, we spent enough time to make the infrastructure fast for a small number of users. But to your question about like crashing all the time, like first day we were down for a couple of hours. I thought my life was over. I thought we had built a good product, got all this good press coverage, and then the site was down for like three hours there. So that was, you know, the best and worst day of my life. Um, and then even from then on to the next like three years, because we were so small, we, weren't, we were able to firefight, but we weren't able to make proactive investments in making the infrastructure you know, super stable. So it wasn't like we'd be down for days, but we'd be down for you know, micro outages pretty often. Like, oh, the site's down for 10 minutes, but we were able to fix it. So at least we did have that ability and that, that philosophy of like, if it is down or something's wrong, we fix it immediately, which meant that our six engineers all carried I was gonna say pagers, but there wasn't pagers. It was just their phone with like a SMS and a laptop everywhere and a little network card, and we could you know get on online anytime. And we really kind of had that as a core cultural principle that like if the site is down, we fix it quickly, which is the next best thing to the site not being down, right? Um, so I guess advice to founders like don't over optimize for like a future that you don't know will exist. Um, don't get too cute with new technologies too. I think one of the things we did well was like we picked fairly established technologies in there. Like our core technology stack early on was Python, which is like was already 10 or 15 years old at the time and has continued to be very solid. Postgres was a very solid database. We were on Amazon, which you know was I think great for us. It meant we could jump forward and not need a lot of infrastructure. So resisting the temptation, like you're inventing a product, don't try to invent technology at the same time unless you have to. Um, and often like our worst choices were the ones that were like the shiny new technology and it was like al almost always a mistake. So you can be boring on the tech stack so you can be interesting on the product side. Yes, Hans Buchel, uh, also Brasileiro e Americano ao mesmo tempo. Um, been entrepreneur for a long time. But kind of an interesting question, and uh, I'm the father of a millennial, mm -hmm. you know, a teenager. 
And I think you would probably qualify as one of the most influential people in his life because of the fact that Instagram is something like Snapchat and other things that they're doing. And I'm sure there are lots of teenage parents here. And just like many years ago, I asked Craig Newmark from uh, Craigslist, you're indirectly influencing a generation that is starting to create, and I can only envision what VR will do, uh, a, a form of addiction in a way in terms of, uh, you know, they're, they're compelled and more and more features towards compelling them to constantly participate and stay connected to their phones. So it's not a problematic question. I just think you'd probably have a lot of insight on the influences that companies like Instagram and others are having on a generation and just your philosophical or understanding of, of where is this all heading, especially as it becomes more and more compelling. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, it's a really valid question. I think of it in two sides, which is how can we promote, what can we promote for that generation that could be really impactful? And then also how do we understand the effect that we have? So maybe I'll start with the second one. So um, a friend of mine who actually went to Stanford with uh, Tristan Harris is like, he has a movement called Time Well Spent. So a lot of tech companies measure time spent and he's very focused on time well spent. And the conversations we've had is really thinking through not just great, you've got people to spend another incremental 30 seconds on Instagram, but understanding what that means, is that valuable time? And are you, uh, are people feeling connected to people because of that time? And are they feeling in control? Are they feeling like, man, I spent another like 30 minutes on Instagram, or not 30 minutes, that'd be good, but another 30 seconds on Instagram incrementally, not that you'd notice, but you know, you'd feel like, ah, like I just feel like I'm using this, I'm just checking it because I wanna check it. And we talk a lot to people and we really try to focus on the feeling that people have on using Instagram. And actually it's been, a cool thing for this year in terms of like in the US, like a lot of obviously political uncertainty and, and it's an in, you know, complicated moment, but I've heard a lot of people say Instagram is the place that is kind of their refuge where it's mostly people's own lives um, rather than articles, et cetera, that they're talking about or getting you know angry about. And when it is political, it's about their their action in the political moment. So it wasn't reporting about the Women's March, it was the account on Instagram that you follow from your friend that went to the Women's March and was empowered to do so. And it's the story that of them doing something interesting. So I think that's the, the positive side of that you know, usage, which is Instagram I think can be a place that is, we try to make it more positive. We spend a lot of time focused on well-being deleting bad comments, letting you turn off your comments so that like there's not trolls on your page. We do a lot of work there because I think it's really important. It's a super interesting area to think about. Then there's also the stories we can highlight. So we have an editorial team. This was a unique thing about Instagram. Our very first hire was not an engineer, designer, product manager, it was a community manager. And they started a team that today is, I think about 20 people focused on editorial, telling stories, running the official at Hoba Instagram account, but also Instagram Brazil, um, Instagram in Spanish, a bunch of these other ones. And those are really cool. Um, opportunity to highlight stories from the millennial generation. So a lot of the stories that we highlight there are, you know, about um, transgender visibility, which is like an interesting topic to think about. And the millennial population on Instagram has been very open to talking about that or positivity online. So we have a whole initiative around it's hashtag kind comments, which is can we like build a more positive uh, version of an online community. So I think we also have I don't know if it's the duty, but we have the opportunity to highlight those stories as well and be a, a force of positivity. But one of our like top level like things that we look at every half in terms of our planning is well-being for exactly the reasons that you mentioned. Hello, my name is Luana. I am one of the founders of Food Divine. We are a marketplace that connects groceries and artisanal producers to local community. And I would like to know uh, which uh, marketing actions do you think that were responsible to make it so popular when you still were uh, a lean startup? We relied a lot on other networks. So um, one of the key pieces of what you could do on Instagram early on was share photos to Twitter and to Facebook. And actually we built out a lot of those, to Twitter, to Tumblr, to Facebook, to, I'm trying to remember all the networks that were around back then. Some of them don't exist anymore. Um, but that was really key because you would see your friends on your other networks and you'd be like, how did you do that? And when you can help people feel awesome about what they created or feel proud of what they created or something that they did, that's a very shareable moment. And then on the other side, the receiver is very interested in how, it, how they were able to do that and connect to that. So that was absolutely huge. We spent zero dollars on like traditional marketing as we were growing. It was all like, it wasn't word of mouth. I think it was like shares basically off to these other networks. So that was, I think, very key. Um, and I think a real inflection point too is when we actually started focusing on 
retention as like the number one thing we care about when we think about growth. So not just saying like, great, a thousand people signed up today, but saying of those thousand people, how many were there in, on day two and day three? And then trying to understand like, oh, it's the people who were able to find some friends. So let's make sure we emphasize that in the registration. And it took actually getting to Facebook where they have a great growth team and a few of them came over and started building that discipline for us. We just got, we were kind of flying blind for the first two years, but I wish now we had brought that in earlier because it's so key to understand that, that it's not like the funnel of people signing up, it's the funnel around what are they doing, how are they staying, I mean, and your company must be super relevant to like the orders placed, people re-engaging and all of that, but getting that knowledge early was, was really, or would have been helpful to have earlier, but it came about two years in for us. Um, bom, thank you for being here. I really admire your work. Um, I also graduated school here. My question is, um, so let's get the Venezuelan example, okay? So we have Maduro, Diosdado, all of these people from the government posting on Instagram, all <laughs> social media about what they think or what they're doing. And then we have the opposition leaders, I don't know, um, Leopoldo Lopez, Lilian Tintori, all of them also posting on Twitter, Instagram. How do you think in the future, uh, in Venezuela that's already happening, so like the main news channel is, is social media, right? How do you think all the social media are gonna replace Forbes or all the, the news channel in the future? And I, I see that in other places too, like Iran is another country where a lot of the um, most recent elections was on social media, including Instagram Live. Um, I think there's a strong role still needed for media that is like doing the longer, like harder in a lot many ways work around investigative reporting. And I think one of the things that I find most interesting is as different models for funding that is, are explored recently, whether that's everything from crowdfunding to more traditional subscriptions to whatever the different models to be explored are. But I absolutely see, you know, if the, um, I think social media can be a super powerful microphone for people and ideally it's actually empowering people that previously did not have a voice to, to be able to speak up and connect and find people that were like-minded. I saw this actually uh, in a lot of the um, government protests in, in Sao Paulo and other places in Brazil. You saw a lot of them connecting and being organized through social media. So I think that's it's really powerful to see that happening. But I don't see that as a replacement for... So in fact, like it actually highlights to me when it makes it clearer when the media is playing that investigative role and how different that is, but it also shows you when the media is like playing more of a like, we're just repeating what's being said on social media. Well, that part feels less needed because there is more of that first party, but that investigative side, I think, is continues to be super important. How many times a day do you check your Instagram feed? <laughs> Very often, well, especially if I'm testing something, right? Then you're like, and actually, I've, I've often, I'll find, this is maybe to your question about it sucks you in, I'll be like, oh, I gotta test this new feature that one of our teams built, and I open Instagram, and then a minute later, I'm like, wait, I was supposed to be testing something, not using the product, and I'll go out, but it's a good sign that I'm still like excited to use the product. So I don't know, actually, it's dozens of times probably a day, especially because we're, we're doing new things all the time, so being able to play with the new, the new products is really key. How about the rest of the world? Oh, I don't know. I actually just, I wish I should, I feel like I should be a better representation of our, of our, uh, of our public numbers because we just updated our time spent numbers, which I think I, I will not try to guess them because we just published updated ones and I don't have them off the top of my head. It's in the like 20s of 20 plus minutes every day on Instagram on average. We'll invite you back in a couple okay, months. Okay, I'll have better stats then. <laughs> um, uh, Mike, uh, I'm going to, my name is Marcio. I'm going to introduce myself to you as a graded dad. So I think a great example for our children uh, at graded. Uh, I'd like to invite you to maybe you know make a, a lecture there for the children. I think they will love it to hear your story. Um, my my question for you is about uh, facial recognition technology. Uh, when do you see that coming, uh, and uh, what the impact will it ha we're going to have with that? Because then the whole thing of privacy changes a lot, and uh, how can index everything you've done in your life, uh, where you've been, and all of those things. So how do you see that? Yeah, and I think there's. This is an excellent question, and obviously it ranges everything from like personal biometrics, like face ID, to like things that sound a lot scarier or are a lot scarier, like you know widespread government surveillance using face recognition. Um, the way I usually think about technology, and this isn't a pessimistic angle because I think I'm generally an optimistic person, but it's more of like a, it's a good thought exercise. It's like don't assume it can't be done. Like think about what could happen if it were to be done, and actually find things like science fiction as like nerdy and dorky, and they are can also be a helpful way of illustrating what could be with that uh, with that technology. So I would say assuming that it is very easy and possible to you know detect faces. Like what is a society or will we want to put in place? Is it everything from government restrictions on how that data gets matched? Is it about, um, you know, the kind, is it a conversation we have as a society about what kind of cameras we're comfortable having out in public? Is it 
doable? Is that even doable given that everybody has a smartphone and like that? That's definitely changing as well. Um, Europe is obviously going through a lot of conversations around privacy and you know I think facial data and just in general like what is your face and what your data and what that represents. Um, but then also like what is the what is the visibility that we can have around how that data is being used? And I think that that's also really, really key as well. And so I don't have answers. I think it's more like questions that I think are interesting to think about as we as we navigate. I think FaceRec is one of them. There's probably things around voice. You probably saw the like creepy AI demo in the last like couple of months where like you can recreate the voice pretty well. And like again, assume that that will be possible. Definitely possible in like the coming years. Like, what do we do about it? How do we verify authenticity, for example, in that world? How do we think about uh, like real versus fake, like the question about investigative reporting, I think gets to that as well. Um, I guess my meta point is like, we can't run from these problems, they're going to happen. And, and I would assume that they're going to happen. And we should get out ahead of thinking through how we'll handle them as a society versus like, what's the expression like, you know, putting the horse back in the barn after it's left or trying to catch up with things. And um, I don't have like any brilliant answers on that. It's more around like how I think about it conceptually. Hi, my name is Kevin Lyman with Mobile Bigfoot. We're a Wi-Fi as service company. Um, and we've been doing work in emerging markets primarily in Chile and Brazil. And you mentioned how live streaming needs a lot of connectivity, right? So what is like Instagram and companies like YouTube doing to improve that connectivity? It's a good question. Um, Facebook has, you know, for a very, very emerging markets. I don't know if emerging is a scale, but if it was a scale on the like very emerging market scale, obviously you'd start to invest in everything from like, um, you know, like airborne, you know, internet connectivity. That's like really just getting people online for the first time. Um, I, at least on the Instagram perspective, we're a smaller team, so we don't have really the time or resources to invest in like, all right, how do we actually make connectivity better? So it's more about working within the constraints and saying, all right, given this amount of bandwidth, how can we make that experience awesome? And like, there's actually a lot. It's cool, actually. Like, it forces the kind of like creative engineering that I think gets lost a little bit when you're like in Silicon Valley with LTE connections and like phones that are super powerful and growing in power every single year. It like goes back to more of like what was hard about computer science earlier, which was working within really interesting constraints and coming up with super creative solutions. So um, that's the kind of mentality that we have. And we're far from where I think we need to be, especially around video delivery and around um, live streaming. But I think it's doable. It's just figuring out the right trade-offs and also inventing the right things that need to be invented. But almost assuming that the network is the adversary in this case, and you're doing your best to deliver a good experience despite that being the, the situation that you're in. Because even if you make progress in one country, there's going to be others that are going to have very similar challenges. Hey, Mike, um, this is João. Uh, when you created Instagram, you created so you could connect people, like you travel a lot when you, you were young. And one of the questions that I have is like, right now we have a lot of brands selling things through Instagram. Mm -hmm. They use people to sell things and we do have the um, sponsored posts. Uh, don't you think this is a threat for Instagram? How do you see this is like, you can be creating a spot for competitors. Uh, how, how do you see the, this kind of things happening in Instagram right now? I think the biggest, not necessarily threat, but the thing to be really conscious of and something we think a lot about is like Instagram, I think is at its best when it feels very authentic. Like one of the things we'd hear from talking to celebrities, you know, then and now about Instagram is that it's the one social media account that they have the password to. Like a lot of the other ones they're like, ah, oh, like I have a social media manager to do it, but I want my Instagram. I want to control it. I want to make it good. I want to like make it authentic. And you see that literally in like which of the cameras they're using, like it's very much the front facing rather than the back facing camera, like metaphorically, like it's photos of themselves talking to themselves, like going live and, and we see a lot of that. And the question for us has been, how do you enable things like sponsored posts, which for a lot of and branded content more generally, which for a lot of people is how they make their lives on Instagram, which is like an interesting effect that we had that I don't think I ever could have anticipated that people could make their living off of being Instagram famous. Um, but we, we've tried to move towards is having much clearer attribution to provide the transparency and hopefully that, that makes it clear what's going on. So. We launched something in the recent, like it's actually just been a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, where now instead of like relying on every individual to make the decision, like oh I'll do like hashtag SP and people are going to know that that means it's sponsored, which is like a little a little vague. Uh, we actually have like an actual paid partnership UI, which is actually good for everybody. So it makes it clearer for the person posting, and I think puts them in like a, mu a much clearer place. 
it also provides metrics for the person, for the brand that has partnered with that account, which they really wanted, because or else they'd be like, great, we paid you to post this thing. Did it work? I don't know, like how many likes did you get? It's not a very good thing. So instead they get actually access the analytics around reach and click throughs and where those people were and did it really match the, the campaign that they tried to do. Um, and then lastly, I think one of the things that's interesting about Instagram is it's asymmetric, meaning you can choose to follow who you want and they don't have to follow you back. And so I think over time, if accounts start feeling inauthentic, and we've seen this happen sometimes, or otherwise like feel like they're no longer like Instagram-y, they see a natural negative effect in terms of the people interacting and following them. And so there's a natural self-correcting mechanism in there. So that's how we've been thinking about those things. And in terms of competitors, it's like, I think, again, I try to focus way more on like what we could be doing better and like continue to be really interesting and engaging and have those really great authentic experiences on Instagram. And then, you know, I think that's, that, that'll speak for itself in the long run. Great, Mike. Uh, so we we have this conference once a year, right? We have many events throughout the year, but and then a full day, this is it, right? And a couple of years ago, we have uh, someone here, the director of engineering from Snapchat. Mm -hmm. And then he told us, you might remember Andrea, uh, wh whoever was here, um, he told us that uh, this time we are building something that Instagram will not copy. <laughs> what is your reaction to people, <laughs> to people that uh, say that Instagram is copying Snapchat? What is your reaction? What do you have to say? Well, first of all, I think like they deserve full credit for coming up with that format, and that's something we've talked about very openly. I think it's very disingenuous to be like, "Oh yeah, like we just came up with that independently." It's like, no, they came up with the format, and it was really you know successful. But I think the question isn't like, can you take a format and put it in your product and like stick it on top like with duct tape and be like, "Great, we're done." I don't think that actually works. So I think the real art and science and, and work is really thinking about what is your product about and what is the full kind of like ecosystem. Eco Instagram isn't really like a product anymore, it's an organism, which is kind of a funny way to think about it. But you can't just introduce a new thing without thinking about its effect on everything else. And so the reason Stories has worked so well on Instagram isn't because we copied it. Like that's, you can stick it on, I don't know if you've seen, there's some really good memes like putting stories on top of Excel and like other products. Like there's a really good jokes. And a part of the joke is that you can't just stick it on something and hope that it works. The reason it works on Instagram is that it, felt, it fit a real need for people, which was they wanted to share more of their lives on Instagram. They used to often do it on Instagram, but as Instagram grew, they felt more pressure to make their feed posts like good or perfect or really high quality, which led to a very high quality product, but also meant that people were self-censoring and not posting. But they didn't really want to like create another account on a different network and grow it. They liked their network. They just didn't like that they couldn't express themselves more freely. So I think the reason stories worked is that we combined things that were really good about Instagram with this format and then made it integrated into your profile and the rest of your feed experience. So I think like, you know, full marks to them for 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 having that. And I think the more we can make things sing inside Instagram and create this thing that actually solves a user problem, we'll be successful. If all we're doing is like taking things from other product and sticking them on, they won't be. Those of you who are tweeting, what a great tweet phrase. Instagram is not a product anymore, it's an organism. Great tweet phrase. And last but not least, what was your first camera and when did you get it? That's a really good question. So I had, you know, I lived in, in Lisboa and I had, um, it was a bear. This book was in Portuguese, and it was this little bear, and he taught you how to take photographs, and it came with this little plastic camera that, it took real film, like 35 millimeter film, so you could get it developed, but what I loved about it was, you know, it gave you these great prompts, like, go out and take a photo of your dog, and, like, take a photo of your dog while it's jumping, and take a, like, it taught you some basics of photography, like composition, but being this very, like, get out of the house and be interactive kind of way. Um, and actually, I dug it up a couple of years ago, and I still I don't have the camera anymore. I have the book with the photos, and it's like the computer I, we had that I was telling you about, and my dog, and I lived in Portugal. So um, it's at our best, Instagram is inspiring people to get out and like interact with the world, and then share back to the people that they care about and connect through that. Great. Just one last question, I promise. Uh, what are your hopes for Brazil? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had <laughs> the last one. I mean, I see so much entrepreneurial potential, so much talent. Um, like people are just having a conversation with other entrepreneurs, like what's missing? And I'm always curious to hear from Brazilian entrepreneurs too. Um, but the, 
a lot of the pieces are there, right? Like there's obviously a market. I mean, maybe the, the economy is not in an awesome place, but it will be again. And I think there will be an interesting market for local startups. There's definitely the talent pool, absolutely. You know, there's pockets of, of people who haven't navigated things like going public as often, but whatever. I think that was the case in Silicon Valley 20 years ago and people learned here, right? It's not, it's not exactly rocket science. Um, and, but I think the instability is one of the things that makes it harder, right? Like for foreign investment, it obviously makes it very complicated, even locally, I think it adds a lot of instability. It's much harder to argue, like, great, like take some stock options instead of taking a salary for the first couple of years. It's like, well, I don't know what the economy is going to be in a couple of years. So I guess my hope in one word, and it's like a, a that one word captures a lot of complicated things that need to be in place for it. But for me, it's stability. It's like, I, I so my wife is American, but, you know, we've been to Brazil a few times together. And there was one, uh, they're going down for Christmas, and she's like, I want to learn more about Brazilian history. So she bought two books. And one was published, I want to say like 2014, and the other one was in 2012. And the 2012 one was like, Brazil on the rise, how it will be the next dominant global power. And then 2014 was like, Brazil's troubled present. And it was like two years. And it's and it, it has been that very kind of cyclical, very up and down. And I think it's it's painful to watch because my fam, a lot of my family is still in Brazil. But I think it also provides this immensely destabilizing like. Uh, effect on, on entrepreneurship. So, you know, that's my hope is, is more stability. Great. Mike, obrigada. Thank you so much.